Hello, welcome to segment seven of the morality class. Um, again, I'd like to remind you to make sure to uh, check the uh, catechist manual, the certification manual, if you are doing this course for certification for the handouts and the worksheets. Um, and this segment of the course, we're going to cover uh, sexual morality. And uh, I guess really when you look at uh, the news and, and just our history, um, the Catholic Church is uh, pretty well known for its stand on sexual morality. Um, we've gotten uh, some good press in some, some cases and some pretty bad press in some other cases. And uh, I think for the most part people's impression out there, particularly if they're not Catholics, would be that the uh, church's stand on sexual morality would be no, a thousand times no. But um, there's a lot more to it than that, and actually our teachings on sexual morality are, are very positive. It's just they are positive toward um, a healthy, integrated sexuality that is following God's plan for it. And so in this segment, I want to try to open that up for you as best I can um, and give you uh, a pretty, I guess, positive sense of what the church's teachings are. Um, I'd like to start with a question again. When you were a child, how did you learn about sexuality, your sex? Did your mom and dad sit you down and have the birds and the bees talk? Or am I dating myself right off the bat with that? Um, when I was in grade school and even high school actually, um, I didn't have uh, that talk with my parents at all. Actually, in my home, uh, sexuality or sex just never really got mentioned. And it probably, for people around my age, that would be a pretty common um, maybe story that people would tell. Um, now, uh, there might have been for some people a kind of awkward uh, talk with mom or dad about, well, you know, you, you've got to be careful. Sometimes maybe happening uh, the week or the night before uh, someone gets married. Um, in the past, uh, the whole issue of human sexuality, the sexuality as a whole, um, was taboo. Not only for Catholics, but just in society in general. It was somehow, it was unspoken. Somehow it had that sort of uh, aura of there's something evil here, there's something shady about this, we're, we're, we're uh, maybe something that should not be said. It was just the spirit of the time, um, for better or for worse, you know, and we all grew up and found out who we were, a uh, book that was very popular when I was a young adult was Everything You Always Wanted to Know About Sex, We Were Afraid to Ask. A lot of people read that book with great interest because there were a lot of things that we didn't know about our human sexuality and, and we didn't know who to ask exactly. Uh, now, it seems like things have really changed. Um, there's a lot of sexual images and in, innuendos. That there's just, uh, in a way, uh, particularly in the media, but in the general conversation, it just seems like we're kind of saturated with human sexuality, sex, you know, it's sex sells, it's all over the place. And um, young people just get a very different experience. I'm not so sure that their talk with mom and dad is that much different <laughs> in some ways, because parents, I think, still has, have a lot of difficulty talking with their parents, but um, it's... Uh, 
much more of an open uh, subject in society. Um, and as parents, it can be pretty challenging. I remember when one of my daughters was in fifth grade, we're riding, uh, coming home from basketball practice, and she says, out of the blue, Dad, how do homosexuals have sex? Well, I wasn't ready for that. And I always felt like, you know, I'm really going to answer my kids' questions as best as I can, just be honest and, and, uh, and really not give them the sense that there's something wrong with this. But because of things she had seen on TV or heard in conversation here or there, that question came up. When I was in fifth grade, that wasn't even on the radar screen. Even what homosexuality was wasn't on the radar screen. So we're just, you know, kind of immersed in it today. And I don't think it really makes it any easier at all. In a sense, young people today have a lot of sophistication about human sexuality. They've heard everything, hopefully not done everything, but not a lot of maturity, not a lot of integration. There's a, been a huge cultural shift. They talk about the, the sexual revolution in, in society that supposedly took place in the 60s. And I think something, a lot did happen when you think about it. Uh, our society went from kind of suppressing human sexuality and and uh, discussion about human sexuality to license. And we went from control to experimentation. We went from inhibition to gratification. We went from mystery to overexposure. We went from sensing that chastity was a virtue, an ideal, to chastity's foolishness. Uh, are we better off? I, I, I doubt it. We've kind of gone from one extreme to the other. The fact is we're sexual beings. And I think it's really important to remember, I'm not sure who said this, but I think it's very wise. Our human sexuality is 90% from the neck up. And it has to do with who we are as a person. It has to do with our desire for intimacy, uh, our need to integrate our sexuality into who we are as a person and as Christians, as Catholic, to integrate it into our spirituality. Sexuality and spirituality are closely linked because it's so, into, so in, inside of who we are. It's so much about our identity, who we are as we stand before one another, as we stand before God. So the church has a lot to say to us about our human sexuality. I think the church offers us as Catholics and society good news regarding human sexuality. Well, what is that good news? Um, first of all, um, our sexuality is an energy within us that moves us to relate and create. And it's just the way we're made. Um, if it weren't for the pleasure and attraction of human sexuality, we might never get married. We might never have kids. So, you know, it's part of kind of our human sort of need to uh, be close and be in touch with another person and in a, in a marriage to bring forth new life. Our sexuality unites our body and spirit. Uh, there have been, throughout history, many religions um, that have felt like somehow everything fleshly, everything natural, um, was somehow sinful. And some of that bled into Christianity in the past to the point where uh, even married couples were encouraged not to have sex at certain times uh, before they received the Eucharist, for instance, because there was something wrong with it. And uh, even married couples were encouraged to see uh, that, you know, get delving too far into their sexual uh, practice with one another, that somehow there, that would be 
sinful or wrong. So the church itself has been influenced by some of those religions that really you could call those religions dualistic. In other words, they felt like the body was somehow evil and the soul or the spirit was good and the body was dragging the soul down. And the thing that dragged the soul down the most was our desires, our sexual desires. Well, um, as we have grown as a uh, church, I think we've gotten way past some of those tendencies. Um, really, uh, true freedom in terms of human sexuality is chastity. And I think that's an ideal we look toward. Chastity is um, really us as human beings be able, being able to uh, use our sexuality, be sexual as God intended us to be sexual, to see our sexuality as a gift from God, and to try to have a sense of what's God want us to do, or how does God want us to be sexual. Society's values really mitigate against this. Uh, according to society today, anything is okay. As a matter of fact, I have a right to have sex in whatever way that I want, as long as I'm not hurting anybody. Um, it Really, sex for pleasure only is fine. Uh, to be naive, in terms of society, is probably the greatest sin. And anything that is consensual, in other, in other words, if whatever is all right with myself and my partner is okay, which has led us into some really crazy uh, places in society in terms of human sexuality. And a lot of people are really deeply wounded because of what has been done to them or what they've done or how they've practiced their sexuality. <clears throat> the church's values are that, uh, in repeating in a sense of what I've said but enlarging on it, that uh, our sexual uh, faculty is a gift from God. It's part of who we are. It's a good thing. But it needs to be used in the right way. <clears throat> Our sexuality has two purposes. It's life-giving and it's love-giving. And uh, Pope John Paul II, um, in a series of homilies that he gave uh, back in the 80s, uh, developed what has been called lately the theology of the body, through which he really expands on this whole, uh, I guess you could say, theory of human sexuality, clarifying how if we look at our bodies and see how our bodies are made, how God created us, we can see how our human sexuality is to be used and how it is a gift. And that's a <clears throat> really very complex but very beautiful uh, working out of what I have called the natural law in this class, the natural law of how our bodies are made and how we are created and, and what our sexuality is all about helps us to see that our sexuality is to be life-giving and love-giving. So, what does this mean? Uh, in terms of a number of different questions in terms of human sexuality, it becomes very clear whether or not a particular practice uh, would be uh, good or evil. Uh, the first thing I think we can say is that uh, intercourse... Um, man and woman coming together physically because of what it is uh, it really is kind of a sacred act. Uh, it's as close as we get to being partners collaborating with God the Creator. We really are doing what God does as a Creator when a man and a woman come together to have intercourse. It, so 
viewing it as a sacred act, we really have to treat it with great reverence. We have to use it in the proper context. And we have to really do it with the purpose that God intends. So that's why the church is very definite about intercourse is for marriage because it's all about totally giving ourselves to one another and a total commitment to one another because that's what's happening physically really and so it should be happening on a spiritual level too. I use a kind of a diagram uh, simple diagram this way to kind of illustrate it somewhat. Um, in intercourse, <clears throat> what our body is doing, total nakedness, total vulnerability, should also be there <clears throat> on an emotional level, um, on a psychological level. In other words, our body is saying, I'm totally yours. Emotionally, we should be saying the same thing. And really, the only way that we could really say that is to be committed to that person. A lifelong commitment, which is marriage. So to say something with my body and not to say it with my will, emotionally, um, is really kind of a lie. And also, in intercourse, our spirit is involved. If it weren't... <clears throat> we'd be splitting ourselves up. So our whole self needs to be committed to, a, to uh, the other person if we're having intercourse with them, which means marriage. And so that, in terms of the commitment level, <clears throat> I think it's pretty clear. Um, the opposite side of that, I think, that you could look at is people who have been used sexually get hurt on these levels, get hurt seriously on those levels. And I think to deny that is really to have our head in the sand about how wounded some people are sexually today if we get used. <clears throat> so intercourse involves a full commitment. That means marriage. Intercourse also is life-giving. It's part of what's happening in the act. And this is what the theology of body tries to clarify. It is a life-giving act. So, uh, it has to be within marriage. And as the church says, clearly, and I think most people have heard this, um, to interrupt or to block that life-giving element of intercourse artificially is wrong. And that's why the church has a strong stand against artificial birth control because we're stepping in and blocking the natural, God-given, life-giving aspect of the act of intercourse. Now, a lot of people would ask, well, what about natural family planning? Isn't that birth control as well? And I don't really have time right now in this uh, uh, session to go into a detailed discussion of natural family planning. <clears throat> but natural family planning, or NFP as it's kind of called, is a method of birth control that doesn't artificially block that life-giving element. What it does is it uses self-discipline and a reading of the, the signs of fertility on the part of the woman and abstaining from Intercourse, instead of blocking artificially the life-giving element, abstaining from intercourse in those fer fertile times. And so natural family planning is really in a different category than artificial birth control. So hopefully you can, kinda, you can see, and there's more information in the handouts on this, but hopefully you can see what I'm talking about is, you know, this is why the church stands against birth control. Some other aspects of human sexuality that we're faced with today and it is uh, kind of commonly accepted uh, in society, <clears throat> why would masturbation be um, seen by the church as um, wrong, as morally 
problematic because masturbation is really selfish sex it's neither life-giving nor love-giving so um, the catechism is really uh, very understanding in some ways about uh, masturbation might be something that because of a lack of maturity or maybe because of certain life situations or certain um, uh, mental or psychological situations it might be a habit that one, get, one gets into and so for this reason it, it's, it's the kind of thing that would have to be uh, dealt with maybe in a counseling session or something like that but uh, we don't want to back off from the fact that masturbation itself is wrong. So the catechism is not saying because it's being compassionate and understanding, go ahead, no problem. But it's saying we don't want to necessarily condemn uh, immature, maybe adolescent boys to hell because they have done this in a kind of time of transition or something like that. But anyway, our sense of this is masturbation is something that really can get to be a problem if we don't look at it as an issue that really is in contrary, is contrary to God's uh, really gift of human sexuality. Um, of course, pornography is something that's uh, seen as being wrong and, and very uh, um, much of a problem, partly because it leads to all kinds of other problems. It uses people. Uh, it's selling sex in a sense. Not in a sense, it is selling sex. And uh, it, it's treating people as objects. Anytime we get to that point in terms of human sexuality, we really have gotten into uh, a situation that's very, very negative. And it's, pornography is a huge multi-billion dollar industry today because there are so many people, I think, who've been sexually wounded. And uh, we really do need... <clears throat> I think more things in society and in the church to help people to recover from some of the woundedness that we've experienced in our human sexuality. Um, homosexuality <clears throat> is seen uh, by the church if it's an orientation. We don't know where that orientation comes from. You know, some churches will condemn homosexuality and all homosexuals just as evil. The Bible mentions homosexuality in different places. Um, there's some debate about what the Bible really says about it. Um, but the Catholic Church in the Catechism tries to clarify this and say, homosexuality as an orientation, there's really no, nothing that we could say is evil about the orientation. There's nothing wrong uh, in a sense, the, the person who's a homosexual, by uh, just their orientation, they haven't really committed a sin. They haven't done anything wrong. Uh, again, we don't know where that comes from. But the practice of homosexuality is against God's law, against God's gift of human sexuality. It can be love-giving, but not life-giving. That's the problem with it. The catechism calls the orientation uh, kind of unnatural um, and uh, disordered, I guess you could say. And uh, so it would treat a homosexual practice the same way as promiscuous sex, the same way it would treat a single person who is having sex with different people outside of marriage. So it would be treat the practice of homosexuality is wrong as promiscuous sex the same way it would uh, or fornication the same way it would for somebody who's not married who's having sex um, another aspect of human sexuality that the catechism doesn't really go into but it's really out there in society a lot these days you hear it a lot is uh, oral sex anal sex you know, all that stuff is it um, is that really sex? I mean, we've dealt with that with uh, you know some of the uh, accusations and uh, of of problems that uh, former President Clinton had. We we hear about it uh, on 
late night television. It's it almost seems like it's just part of the conversation today. And I'm not sure what young people are thinking about all this, except that um, it needs to be clarified, really, for all of us, but for young people, that uh, that is uh, wrong. It's a practice of human sexuality. It's not intercourse, but it's uh, really practicing sex for for uh, pleasure only. And so, again, there's a lot of confusion about that today. Uh, a lot of people have the wrong idea, well, it's not really sex, but it is. Um, the question that might come up uh, um, and would uh, come up among young people, uh, if you maybe teach young people or you have some uh, children who are teens themselves, how far can we go? And I think it's really important to try to answer that question as best we can. There are four kinds of relationships that might help us understand how far we can go in any relationship. In other words, the old discussion was first base, just kissing, second base, kissing and holding, and, and all the way to third base and home, uh, coming home is to have intercourse. Young people want to have a sense of, well, you know, let's kind of get right up to the line and not cross the line. And this question, how far can we go, maybe isn't a very good question because it's kind of saying, I want to try to take advantage of this as far as I can without maybe threatening my salvation. Uh, I think we're better off looking at it from a sense of what's the relationship uh, like. Uh, there are different kinds of relationships. A love relationship is when I consider the other person's well-being as important or more important than my own. Is that the kind of relationship you're in? If it is, it doesn't mean you can have intercourse, but it means that you can express yourself in maybe some physical ways that would be honest, that would be fitting, you know, your emotion and your spirit is in tune with your body. But still, for teenagers, we don't want to encourage them to get very far into physical sexuality because at a certain point, you just kind of end up going where maybe it's not a good idea to go. But again, looking at the relationship is really important. Uh, another kind of relationship is infatuation. Infatuation might feel like love, but it really isn't. It might be the beginnings of a love relationship, but it it's really might not be too. It's when we're kind of all on fire or kind of have a, a crush on somebody. Uh, that kind of relationship is not very mature. Uh, a friendship um, is a kind of relationship where um, we really uh, are in tune with another person. We um, would care about that person and share a lot of things. Um, and then exploitation is a kind of relationship where we're trying to, uh, uh, exploitation, uh, where we're trying to maybe manipulate them and get out of them what we can. I think young people need to know the difference between these four kind of relationships and know that intercourse is not an option in any of them, but we might be really taking advantage of or hurting another person greatly in, uh, if, if we're trying to say something to them physically that's not true emotionally. Probably going back to the old days, a good thing to tell young people and to tell all of us is that uh, to avoid near occasions of sin. In other words, there are things that if we do them are going to lead to other things that will lead to other things, particularly in the area of human sexuality. If we end up spending a lot of time alone, and uh, particularly if we've had alcohol is mixed in with it, we can get involved with another person physically uh, in, in a way that we can't stop. In other words, we move into a progression of physical acts that lead to intercourse. And so we need to make sure we don't do the first thing 
Um, and for young people, kisses and hugs and, and fondling, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, it is going to eventually lead to intercourse. And so avoiding the first steps will keep us from making the big mistake going to the last step. Anyway, this whole area of human sexuality is, is really a beautiful thing. Uh, chastity is our ability to use our human sexuality the way God intended.